Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco, blazing across the land, into your town, into your home, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings to all of you from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, the planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophony of conversation. Happy that you decided to spend some time on your holiday weekend right here with us. As I mentioned last night, Memorial Day is the most thoughtful of American holidays. Um, So in between the barbecues or trips to the beach or family get-togethers, it only takes a minute or so to think about the reason this day was set aside, honoring those who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, our freedoms, and uh, our way of life. For many of you, the holiday means you can turn off the alarm clock, sleep in late, so no need to head for the office or the job site tomorrow, and that means... You can stay up late with us, not be dragging your butt tomorrow. I had in mind we might cast a wide net this evening, look at some big picture stuff regarding one of our core topics, the UFO mystery. And I know from reading uh, emails that at least a couple of you don't want to hear about UFOs, or you figure if you've heard one UFO discussion, you've heard them all. And I understand that. But as I've said before on the program, this subject is one of our core topics. So if you are listening to Coast and you don't like UFOs, it might not be the program for you when all is said and done because we're not going to stop covering it or asking about it or talking about it. And I'll explain that. Um, I, I've been chasing this stuff for more than 25 years now, and, and the thing that keeps it interesting for me is it's always changing. There's new stuff, not only new sightings or new cases, but new theories, uh, new explanations for what it all means Always new points of view, fresh voices, people who are attracted to the topic. They climb that that steep learning curve, and then they share their own take on it. Uh, Some of the disputes between uh, the leading lights of ufology get into such minutia, such arcane stuff that, you know, to the uninitiated, it must sound like a foreign language. They'd have no idea what the heck it means. Uh, You know, when did the Air Force start uh, using crash test dummies Uh, How many flights of the mogul balloon were ever launched? What kind of typewriter was used on such and such a memo from the Pentagon? You know, some of this stuff, it might as well be Sanskrit. The personalities are always a big part of the ever-changing UFO landscape. They have these huge fights, bitter rivalries, backstabbing and name-calling and turf wars. There's disinformation and misinformation, and they're spying by government agencies, three-letter agencies, And no matter what they say or admit to, they do pay attention to this stuff. You put it all together, it's like a primetime soap opera, but with flying saucers. So if you think you've heard one UFO show, you've heard them all, you're not paying attention. Uh, For certain, I would not still be doing this if I didn't think it was worthwhile, that it might end up leading to an ultimate truth about what amounts to the biggest story in human history. And I especially wouldn't still be involved if it stopped being fun, because it is. It's fun to chase down the various tentacles of this mystery. Uh, For me, as a journalist, the most enticing part of the story has always been the government's reaction to this stuff. You know, I can't predict when UFOs are going to show up. You can't reproduce what witnesses say they've seen. But I can chase the paper trail, try to find documents Uh, Things that they say behind closed doors, interview officials or military folks, people who were there. For me, it's a news story. It's not a religion. It's not a belief system. It's a story, and it's a big story at that, probably the biggest of all time, if it could be confirmed. So tonight for our uh, pre-holiday show, I thought we might cover a lot of UFO ground, current issues, new cases, uh, some strong opinions mixed in with a couple of golden oldies. Coming up in the second half of the program tonight will be John Ventry making his first appearance on Coast. He is new to the show, but not new to the subject. He's currently the MUFON State Director for Pennsylvania. Uh, MUFON, of course, the Mutual UFO Network, the world's largest UFO research organization. He has uh, extensive experience with the topic. He's a frequent speaker at UFO conferences. He's written several UFO-related books, including a new one called An Alternative History of Mankind. 
And I'll tell you, this gives a reader a lot to chew on. But you might know him from a recent History Channel series, Hangar One. Pretty good series compared to some of the junk that cable TV has forced down our gullets about UFOs over the years. Uh, John takes a very broad view of the UFO picture, sort of how it relates to the development of our species. And I think you'll enjoy hearing what he has to say coming up in the second half. Uh, Before that, in hour two, our friend Alejandro Rojas, formerly with MUFON, now on Open Minds. That's a multimedia UFO news source. Uh, As you know, we invite Alejandro on the program from time to time to kind of update current events in ufology. And I am told he is locked and loaded tonight, ready to tell us about a couple of efforts to force disclosure, plus some provocative new cases from around the world. Uh, As for this first hour, I have what I think is a pretty good stuff. I told you last week that this month marks the 25th anniversary of a pretty big story in the world of UFOs, Area 51. A quarter of a century ago, a shadowy guy who went by the pseudonym Dennis appeared on television here in Las Vegas and told an amazing story. He said he'd been working at a facility known as S-4, which is south of Groom Lake, better known today as Area 51. He said he worked on flying saucers, that his employer, the U.S. Navy, uh, was taking these saucers apart to figure out how they worked, meaning they came from somewhere else. We didn't build them. And he added that the technology was not of this world. Uh, It was a gravity generator that creates its own gravitational field that allows the spacecraft to essentially bend space and time to travel anywhere in less than a blink of an eye. We didn't know then who this man was when he gave us that first interview in Silhouette, but his statements put Area 51 on the map. A few of you listening tonight had ever heard of the place before Bob uh, mentioned it on the air, on, on television. And today, it's known all over the world. It's been in major movies. It's been in TV dramas, uh, talk shows. I can tell you that uh, we took a lot of guff uh, and criticism in those early days. But since then, every major news organization in the world has uh, essentially beaten a path to Area 51's door. It spawned uh, countless product lines, uh, posters and T-shirts. There's a rock band. There's a bar. Uh, cocktails named for it. There's a brothel, uh, beef jerky, uh, the first ET highway sanctioned by the state of Nevada. We have our AAA baseball team here in Las Vegas, the Las Vegas 51s. We didn't know back then how big it would get or how brutal the scrutiny of Lazar would be. As you might know, I finally coaxed him into sitting down for a new interview 25 years later, and it wasn't easy. If Bob is a UFO con man, as some people think, or is trying to cash in on his fame or infamy, you might say, he is the most reluctant participant I've ever encountered. It's like pulling teeth to get him to talk. It was true back then, a quarter century ago. It's just as true today. So I used a a couple of clips from the new interview in two news reports that we aired here in Las Vegas, and then we posted them online, and they went all over the world. But there's a lot more that we didn't use, and I figured Coast to Coast would be a good place to roll it on out. So that's what we're going to do in this hour. I'll I'll play some extended segments from the interview with Bob Lazar, and then toward the end of this hour, we'll take some calls and hear what's on your mind, gauge your reactions to what you're about to hear. There are a couple of news stories I want to mention tonight and also tell you about items we posted on the Coast website under NAPS News. But for timing purposes, I think we'll wait on those so that I can make sure I'm able to fit a couple of these clips from the Lazar interview into this half hour. Uh, So let's go ahead and take our first break, then come back and jump into this interview. And then if time allows, I'll talk about those news stories we wanted to cover. I'm George Knapp, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. Here we go. Uh, 25 years ago this month, I was anchoring an evening newscast on KLAS-TV. And our guest, we have an interview segment, a live interview each night, and our guest canceled at the last minute. So I called up a guy named John Lear, and I said, hey, you know that saucer guy you've been telling me about? Do you think he'd do the interview? Lear had a certain amount of credibility with KLAS because he had helped us break the story of the uh, stealth fighter. Uh, We were the first news organization in the country to say it was real, and it was being flown up there in the Nevada desert. It had been test flown at a place called Area 51. So because of that credibility, uh, he had come into the station and and tried to interest my boss in in all this pile of UFO documents. The boss didn't go for it, but I said, I was eavesdropping. I said, let me look at this stuff. I put John Lear on a talk show that we had at the time, and the reaction from the audience was pretty big. 
did a second show with him. The audience reaction was even bigger. And I'm wondering, what the heck is the story on this UFO stuff? How does it touch the pulse of the public in this way? In a third show we did with Lear, he had hinted he knew a guy who, uh, who might have a job out there at Area 51 and knew something about the saucers. The guy he was talking about was Bob Lazar. Eventually, uh, we got him on a, uh, did this interview in May of 1989 uh, in silhouette, and he told us this fantastic story. Uh, in recognition of the 25th anniversary of that very weird time, I, I coaxed and cajoled Bob into coming out to Las Vegas for a new interview. And one of the things we talked about was his reluctance to embrace this subject. He's tried to walk away from it. He doesn't give interviews anymore. He doesn't respond to UFO emails or letters or inquiries. He is not on the UFO lecture circuit, certainly hasn't made a big pile of dough. He told me he gets calls and emails every day from people who insist, look, you've got to answer this. I need to know. Uh, But he doesn't. Here's what he said about his UFO notoriety in our latest sit down. If we can roll the tape. But that drives him crazy. I mean, That's you need fine. to answer this. Now, I need an answer. How much? How many times do you get that in a, in a week still after all this Oh, time? I get, you I get, to there isn't this. a day I, I don't get emails. And, you know, I try and get this across to him. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great. Pass it around. <laughs> you know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. I'm trying to do serious research. I'm, you know, I've got contract with governments and other companies for R&D work and aside from, you know, other scientific interests. And I want this divorced. Look, if I went and did everything I can to prove my story and reached a tipping point for where people like Stanton Friedman and, you know, people uh, uh, along those lines um, said, you know what, this is beginning to look factual. Do you know how that would annihilate me? That would destroy my business. It would make it impossible for me to operate. And, you know, I'd have a continuous flow of questions, annoying people, and sure offers to do things that I am not the least bit interested in. Which is how it was for years. Yeah. It was for years, right? Look, I could have jumped on all that stuff. I could have, you know, at Area 51 sports drinks, and I could have been giving... Look how many lectures. At one point, I had... uh, uh, what's that talk show host that, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Which one? Raldo, Suspenders. Montel. And, um, old guy, Larry Suspenders. Larry King. Larry King. Yeah, he, I mean, I had an open invitation at one time for that show to come on. As the, you know, Geraldo, everybody, you know, I turned down everything. Montel Williams. I blew off movie scripts. I blew off all kinds of stuff because they couldn't stick to facts. Is there a part of you, though, that... There's got to be part of you somewhere in there, even though it would be counterproductive. There's got to be part of you that wishes, God damn it, I, I know what happened. It's true. No, look, I know what happened is true. There's no doubt, period. There's, there's no delusion. And there are some things I can say that, that will bolster the case, and I'm not going to. Um, it's going to stay that way. I do regret, at this point, bringing anything forward. Look, at the time, I'm in my early 20s. I went, you know what? This is a crime against the American people. This is just BS, and everybody deserves to know what's going on. You know, and 25 years goes by, you get a little older, and your priorities change. And, you know, what they told me is, this is a security matter, and really, what's the public going to do without this? You know how reactionary they are? It's... There's a bunch of different reasons this is being kept quiet. Nothing that they bother telling me. But the bottom line is they're right. The bulk of the people are complete morons. And I'm sorry. Maybe they are right. And this really should just be just be information that's handled out on a, on a need-to-know basis to some people where it would benefit them. Uh, According to Lazar, there were nine flying disks in these hangars built into the side of a mountain at a place called S-4. Uh, He saw only one of these things fly. He called it the sport model. He says it was powered by a unique engine, a gravity generator. He witnessed some lab experiments with this generator, and it was, for all intents and purposes, magical. Among other things, he and his co-worker bounced a golf ball off this invisible force field, and then they did an experiment with a candle. Here he tells us about it. That alone is something amazing. Look, that can change 
everything we know today just having a machine to produce artificial gravity. Because look, look at what that does. We know gravity, space, and time are all tied together. There are your shields, like on Star Trek, that you know deflect micrometeorites. There is your protection from radiation without heavy shielding. There is something that, with an intense enough focused field, you can actually bend space. And there is something that can actually alter the flow of time. I mean, that's the missing piece of pie. Didn't they actually freeze a, a, a flame, candle? A flame freeze. Yeah. Now that's when it was connected to the gravity amplifiers where they could focus it and uh, that they, was they froze a candle a flame yeah they flame. had a they had a candle lit uh, to set it up for you um, again there's a large in the craft itself there are three long pipes um, I'd say uh, well I don't know about what's that three four feet in diameter maybe f five feet long um, anyway they dangle the three of them at the bottom of the craft, these produce gravitational waves and they can focus them to a point or spread them apart. Those um, are what you call the wave guides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're part of the uh, power source control mechanism and the uh, wave, well, the wave guide is what I actually call the interlink between okay. them, but that that's the gravitational engine. Um, they had one of those devices out along with the subsystem that connects it. So they can produce the power from the reactor, it runs the gravity amplifier, and they can focus and change the gravity beam that comes out of it. They took, a, they were speaking of Barry, took a candle, put it close to the mouth of it, lit it, a normal flickering candle flame, and then activated the reactor. The gravity wave came out as expected, and the candle flame remained luminous, and stopped moving, and Which I mean, physics. yeah, because the look, photons. if it's going to freeze it, the photons should stop being emitted. If it's going to, you know, change the characteristics, look, how can the combustion continue to take place without the convection inside the flame? Because actually, the reason a flame is elongated is not not really because of heat; it's because of gravity. Because gravity pulls down and you know, convection moves flames upward. It's why in, in a zero-gravity environment, flame is a ball, obviously. There's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if, uh, look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, he, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but it's also time lock. You've they distorted froze a the... frame of time. Yeah, they it essentially froze a, a, a piece of time there, and I... You know what do you say? I mean, you're—it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it. It's not—it's not, it's not a. Could see it. it doesn't make sense that you could see it. And uh, look, it—the it, stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it—it—it it, it defied what what we knew as physics, and uh, at least I thought it did. And maybe what we knew was <laughs> a little incorrect. You can tell from that that although he hasn't talked about this stuff in a long time, he was kind of getting into it, and uh, and he admitted that later in the interview. He said, well, "Boy, just uh, just bringing it back up again got him kind of excited as he was when he was first involved in that program." The other voice you're hearing in the background is Gene Huff, who's a good friend of Bob's and uh, was a partner of his in in various ventures for a time. Uh, you know, during that time period, there was a lot of weird stuff happened. Uh, People in the UFO field have, have generally made up their minds about Bob Lazar. They either believe him or they don't. Uh, to him, as you heard in the first clip, it really doesn't matter. And and although it was important to me in the beginning, I mean, I'm chasing this story. It's the biggest story I I had done at that point, and it got a lot of attention. I wanted it to be true. I wanted uh, to have proof. But, you know, I'm sort of of the same mind now. It, it really doesn't matter. We're never going to have definitive proof. I don't think the folks at S4 are ever going to open up the hangar doors and let people in there to kick the tires on the flying saucers or take a look or taking them for a spin, assuming they're even there anymore. I mean, there's been so much attention uh, put on that part of the, the Nevada desert. So as I mentioned, so many media organizations have gone there looking for whatever is flying around in the sky. A lot of folks think it was a disinformation ploy that it was meant to 
distract attention away from something else that was going on out there. If that were the case, man, they made a big mistake because they got a lot more attention than they ever imagined. Uh, all I can say is, you know, there was a lot of really weird stuff that happened. We were followed around, not only Lazar, Lazar but me and uh, John Lear, Gene Huff, and a couple of others. Phones were tapped. A lot of mind games were played. When we come back, we'll hear a third clip from this interview in which Bob talks about Element 115. We're talking about Bob Lazar in Area 51, including some excerpts from a recent interview we did on the 25th anniversary of that story breaking. When we come back, we'll get into uh, the story about Element 115, and we'll take a couple of your calls here on Coast to Coast AM. As I was saying before the break, you know, it was one of those kind of uh, you had to be there things. It was a very weird time. A lot of weird stuff. Mischief, mind games were being played, phones tapped, people were following us around. One reason I know about that is some of the guys who were doing it later told me about it after they no longer worked out there. Uh, you know, I, I was there. I, I can tell you that Bob Lazar didn't make that part of the story up. It doesn't mean that his entire story is the literal truth or the whole truth. I, I don't think he's a willing participant in a fairy tale or government disinformation. Uh, one other aspect I want to cover is the fuel for the spaceships, the the power source for that amazing gravity generator we just heard about, and he said it was something called Element 115. It did not exist back in 1989 when uh, Bob first talked about it, but it does now. It was synthesized by some Russian scientists several years ago and then confirmed by scientists here. The Element 115 that they made wasn't like what Lazar described. He said there was 500 pounds of this stuff. It was orange. It was stable. The stuff that they made in the lab was... Uh, fleeting. It was just a tiny amount of it, and it didn't last very long. But at last, we know there is such a thing, and here's what Bob had to say about it. They finally did uh, synthesize Element 115 that had the properties that I that I stated. Um, not, um, But it wasn't stable. Yeah, it wasn't stable. Uh, now, each element has isotopes. For instance, you know, let's talk about hydrogen. We're all familiar with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has three isotopes. They're all hydrogen. There's hydrogen, protium, would be the technical name, deuterium, and tritium. Well, tritium is a radioactive hydrogen. Uh, deuterium is another stable isotope of hydrogen. And regular protium, ordinary hydrogen, is the hydrogen we all know. They're all hydrogen. They have different amounts of neutrons in them. Um, they all have one proton, which makes them hydrogen. Now, this is a true for all elements. You can have the amount of protons in them determines what element it is. So element 115 has 115 protons in it. It's element 115. Now, depending on the number of neutrons it has, it will still be element 115, but it can be any number of isotopes of it. It's 115 undoubtedly has, you know, many isotopes of it. We've synthesized 115. We made one isotope. We have a radioactive one. Now they just need to continue on working with it. I mean, they made just a few atoms, but uh, we'll see what other isotopes they come up with. One of them, or more, is going to be stable, and it will have the exact properties that or, I said. Or could we make it? Or does it have to be natural? As You speculated well, about that. Well, before. it's natural. It'd be difficult to find it. I, I do not think you can make that synthetically. It's just, it takes too much time. I mean, to make you know an ounce of it, or even a gram, would take a tremendous amount of time because not all the interactions are successful. I mean, you can bang particles together all day long and one may get stuck and then you've got an atom. And how do you contain, you know, this single atom? So how do we get 500 pounds of it? Where'd that come from? Well, it, it, it had to either be uh, synthesized by the extraterrestrials that bought it in the first place or, you know, maybe there was a, a location where they came from where, look, that this was a naturally occurring material. We know that all the material in the universe, essentially all the atoms of all elements, came from hydrogen. I mean, all you really need is, it, it is just atoms of hydrogen to make anything. Once they start collecting together large quantities of them, gravity just begins to push them together under their own weight. As long as you have enough hydrogen, that'll continue until they finally crush down and ignite and produce a fusion reaction, and that starts a star. Once the star is burning, it begins to produce helium by fusing, so now you have another new element. Well, this continues on until the star burns out, begins to collapse, and 
when you know large enough stars finally do they crush down produce supernovas and then produce a whole host of every element on the periodic chart far beyond what we're the, the numbers we're used to beyond 115 and you know maybe some of these this, this where all the gold all the uranium every element you have ever come from including every cell in your body has come from supernovas that's the factory that makes elements so if there was a location somewhere else that had bigger stars multiple stars that burped out more heavy elements than you know our local system did maybe this is common and you can find stable 115 like we mine for gold on you know on our planets or uranium it just depends if they were lucky enough to have exotic materials like that I find that easier to believe than somebody built a machine to manufacture such a difficult material. So it's sort of like a Rorschach test. Aha, they made 115. He was right. It really does exist. Somebody who doesn't want to believe it says, 115 doesn't behave anything like Bob Lazar said. It's sitting around in a pile of 500 pounds or something. Right? I mean, it's sort of like that. What is the... Right. You have to... I mean, you just have to start accumulating whether you believe it or not and... I personally, again, I prefer you don't believe it. Um, you know, just begin accumulating the facts that you can, you know, you can verify. So what are we to make of all that? I, you know, I don't know how to answer it. I, I don't think we're ever going to know for sure. There are some problems with Bob Lazar's claims, specifically about his claimed educational credentials. Uh, you know, they have been thoroughly vetted, and uh, people have said, aha, he didn't go to MIT. Well, I know that. Uh, we know it because in the very first report we aired, we said there's no verification. There's no cred uh, records that show he went to MIT. It's not like somebody caught him in a lie. That was in the first report ever broadcast that had his name in it. Uh, but before you dismiss it entirely, and some people have because of that problem, there needs to be an explanation about other things that he knew. He knew about test flights of these flying saucers. He knew because he took people out three weeks in a row to show them, and they videotaped them. How did he know? Uh, he knew about a place called S-4. That's real. That's confirmed. He knew about an agency called the OFI, Office of Federal Investigation. Bob said that they were the ones doing the background check on him. Well, I'd never heard of them before. I've worked in here for a lot of years, and... I never heard of it, but sure enough, that's a real agency that does background checks. Uh, he knew about a name of a guy named Mike Thigpen, who was an agent for the OFI, and we confirmed that. He also knew how to pass a polygraph test. He passed a polygraph test. Um, so, you know, it's not easy to just write it off as some people have. But, you know what, you can make up your own mind. We're going to post these video clips, um, these excerpts, on the Coast website if you want to see the video, see the conversation as it unfolded, and, and hear this again. We'll, we'll have it up there real soon. And we'll go now to the phones and see what's on your mind. East of the Rockies, Lonnie in North Carolina. Hi, Lonnie. Hi. How are you doing? Okay. Uh, I met this guy years ago, and long story short, he uh, had connections, and I started asking him questions and things. And uh, every question I asked, he seemed to answer properly <laughs> as to what I've learned from mostly coast to coast. But uh, – his wife was telling a story about when she was younger, she was in Florida, and she was driving along at night with her mom, and the uh, light came out from the sky, the engine stopped, the radio turned off, and uh, I started to ask her about missing time, and when you were talking with Bob about the uh, candle experiment, uh, what he said was, it's all a matter of what you think time is, and he said that when that happens, the light the uh, engine and the radio never turned off. Well, so uh, that's, that, that's sort of fits, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's like time has stopped. There, there was an old, uh, I'm not sure, remember if it was Twilight Zone or one of those stories where astronauts come back to the Earth and everybody looks like they're motionless. And after a little while, they figured out that they were actually moving very, very, very slowly. Bob uh, Lazar had told us that uh, it, back in the beginning, and I had a hard time getting my head around it at first, that uh, this, this propulsion system wasn't really – it didn't really propel the craft toward Earth from somewhere way out in space. It, it created its own gravitational field, and it bent space and time. It basically brought Earth closer to it uh, by creating its own gravitational force, which is incredible. But other people have said the same kind of thing. They've talked about UFOs. They've looked at the – 
characteristics that have been reported over the years. Uh, even Jacques Vallée, who has said, and I'm not saying he endorses Bob, but he said, look, these things are able to bend space and time in ways that we do not understand. And if you can bend space and time, if you can do that, you could be from anywhere. You could be extraterrestrial or interdimensional. You could become from the future. You could be all the above. So, um, you know, I, I think the story you're telling me is very consistent with what Jacques had said, with what Lazar had said, and with what he says uh, was out there, the technology that was out there in the Nevada desert. That sounds uh, exactly right, and I appreciate all you guys. I, I'm a uh, nighttime worker, so I've listened to art since a long time ago, and and my favorite uh, guests have been uh, John Lear and Ed Dames. And <laughs> once you start putting a lot of these things together, it all makes sense. Thanks, Lonnie. Appreciate you, and, you calling uh, in. One other quick thing. Sure. I also don't think that it conflicts with you know the basic stories of the Bible or or any of the ancient writings either. Well, I, I, I put that question to several uh, different religious leaders when I first went down this path. I said, I wonder what, what uh, different faiths and denominations would say about it if it were true. They all gave me the same answer. They don't have a problem with it. Uh, it's more souls to save. doesn't matter if it's uh, alien or earthling. If it was, It's a testament to the greater glory of God is what Catholics, Mormons, Baptists all told me. And I, and I think uh, surveys have, have pointed that out. Thanks for the call, Lonnie. Appreciate it. West of the Rockies, Ryan in Washington. What's on your mind, Ryan? Yes, uh, George, is it true that uh, you've had other sources, other people who work out there who can verify the story? And also, um, do you, had you ever plan on putting together in a book or, or, or putting all this together, and not just Bob, but other uh, sources? Is it true that that you had one high-level source that you can't reveal, but that um, he actually told you that he saw a video um, of one of the pilots of one of these craft. I mean, is, is all this stuff true? Uh, close. Uh, if it was just Bob Lazar, uh, although I found, found his story to be compelling, if it was just him making this story, it would never have been on the air. Uh, but over the years, I mean, we spent a long time working on this. We spent eight months after that uh, that shadow interview, that silhouette interview, eight months working on it, trying to verify not only his story, but seeing if anyone else would come forward. And we did. I've got more than two dozen people who've worked out at Area 51 over the years at Groom Lake. They worked there in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, who have told me bits and pieces of the same story. Uh, not many of them. In fact, only two other ones had uh, the sort of the as much information as Bob did, but all of those stories were sort of consistent with the story he told, that they had seen craft out there, that they had seen them flying, that they had walked into into hangars and, and had been, um, you know, seen something under a tarp. Six of those people who told me this these, their stories agreed to go on camera. This is how I know we were being messed with. Six of those people had offered to go on camera. They wanted their identities uh, hidden. And they talked to me on the phone and said, uh, yeah, I'll tell you that story, but you got to protect me. One right after another were visited by people who told them, keep your mouth shut. In one case, a lady was told she worked in the judicial system here and a cop had, had introduced us. She had told me on the, on the phone, yeah, I'll tell you my story. I had sat in on some meetings with high-level military folks, and they talked about crashed saucer stuff going out to Area 51 and she was under this security oath. And after she said on the phone that she was going to talk to me, she was visited by two guys who came and told her, look, you are still under uh, conditions of your security oath. We know that you travel back and forth to L.A. to visit your daughter. And we know that she travels to see you. It's a big desert out there. We'd hate for something bad to happen to a member of your family. Now, this lady was petrified. She considered it to be a death threat. I didn't make that stuff up. That it was somebody was listening to our phone because I had five other people just like her who offered to give me information who got the same kind of visit, who got the knock on the door. Uh, so, you know, it was, like I said, it was kind of a thing where you had to be there. But, yes, I had more than two dozen people who had given me bits and pieces, and there was a source that I stalked. I basically stalked this guy. I sort of figured out. Who would know? Who was in a position to know back in the early days when 51 was first built? And I settled on this guy, and so I started showing up at public events, and I got to know him and introduced him, and I went to his house, and uh, 
and he showed me his scrapbooks about the atomic testing program. And, and finally, he closed the closed the scrapbook and he said, I, I, you're not here to talk about this, are you? I said, no, not really. He said, I know what you're here to talk about. And then he started telling me. And for a period of almost two years, I had these meetings with him where he filled me in on the big picture. And he promised in the end that he did see one of these creatures. He didn't see videotape. He saw a creature. And uh, and he said he would make a videotape and would be uh, make it available to me through his family members after his passing. He's still alive. I know that he made the tape, um, but I'm not quite sure if he's going to still give it to me or not. Some things have changed that I won't go into there. But, yeah, if it had just been Bob, probably wouldn't have gone with the story. Uh, but other people did come forward, and there's other bits and pieces of the story that we were able to verify enough that we were confident in going forward with it on the air. Thanks for the call, Ryan. Try to get one more call in. Uh, Paul, first-time caller in Oregon. Hi, Paul. What's on your mind? Um, I have a number of different things for you. I've witnessed uh, my first was a long black triangle in the southern Oregon area in 1984. I grew up watching air shows, going to air shows, flying in jets, seeing what they could do, seeing what they couldn't do. And I witnessed for two and a half hours something that my wife and I kept on saying as we were impossible maneuvers, uh, complete reversals at high speed, bank maneuvers that would have blacked out any pilot on the earth, a radical monk thin black triangle, bright lights at the apex tips, um, um, kind of vague black bottom but a bezeled edge, a double bezeled edge, and it was doing about five miles an hour, and then it blazed out. And then the next morning... We got a gift. We got eight black helicopters showed up in the ridge where I lived. Um, I recognized all of them, and all of them were were painted with black, no numbers. And we had, let's see, two tandem rotor lifters, uh, Chinooks. We had four, they call them skids from Vietnam, with full munition packs, all in black. And then we were, everybody in our place just said denied when we told them the next morning what we witnessed. Ten years later, I saw one that was so significantly beyond that one that the technology was was stymieing. And then about ten years after that, I talked to some guy I picked up on the road. I said, what do you do for a living? He goes, I work for the NSA. I said, get out of the car. He goes, no, 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 I'm okay. I said, okay. I saw a UFO in 1984. He goes, where would you see it? And I told him, he goes, well, that was the Applegate incident. I said, what do you know? He goes, well, what did you see? And I told him about the black helicopters, and he said, uh, well, something went down there, and we picked it up. I said, swell. I said, you scared the crap out of everybody in my ridge over the morning with those eight black birds coming in at like two or 300 feet. I said, that was horrifying. So the stuff that's going on, I couldn't agree more. I Like I say, I've seen enough now. I no longer look up. I've given up looking up. I'm confirmed. I know what I'm seeing. I've been around enough planes that do things that are incredible. I've had two friends that work at Area 51. One worked in the early 50s on the Redstone Nike Zeus programs, and he said he saw a dematerialization experiment that was extraordinary. So if that happened in the 1961 bracket, what the heck have they done since then? So uh, I would tell you in all honesty, I believe. I've seen it. I'm I'm stuck with it. My wife and I both seen both incidences. Um, I've never in my life witnessed anything like that. So I tell you, it's real. Paul, I appreciate you sharing that story with us. When it comes to these black triangles, it's sometimes hard to tell. We've made so many advances. I know we've got some things like black triangles, big ones and small ones that zip around. Hard to tell uh, if it's theirs or ours. Uh, the, the former head of Lockheed Skunk Works had testified before he died that we've got things that would make George Lucas drool. Um, so, you know, it, I think it gets harder and harder to tell the difference. But uh, I think what, from the description you got, you gave us, it might be somebody else's. Thanks for the call. Thanks for all the callers. I hope you enjoyed those clips. We'll put them on, uh, on the Coast website, as I mentioned.